In this session we come back to the problem of proving properties about programs. Where before we covered just lists, we will now look at more general data structures, namely trees. Remember, in the intro to this course I told you that functional programming is important because it's very close to the mathematical theories of data structures. We put that to a test now. We will develop such a theory for integer sets and prove an implementation correct with respect to the theory. As was the case in the previous proving sessions, the material in this session is optional for the online class. If you're a student of the live EPFL class, you should follow the material because it might be relevant for the exam. So we can generalize the structural induction principle for lists to arbitrary tree structures. The principle then becomes the following. We want to prove a property P of T for all trees of a certain type. What we need to do to do that is we need to show that P of L holds for all leaves types of the tree and for each type of internal node T, which has let's say subtrees S1 to Sn, we need to show that under the assumption that P S1 and P S n, all the sub all the subtrees satisfy the predicate, then P of T holds. So let's use this proof technique to show some interesting facts about insets. Recall our definition of insets from previous sessions. We had an abstract class inset with operation include and contains. And then we had two different implementations. Once was, one was an object empty and the other was the class non-empty. And there was an invariant we assumed and that was that the elements in a tree were ordered. That means that the left subtree of any non-empty tree contained elements that were smaller, all smaller than the current element and the right subtree contained elements that were larger. And our implementations of contains and include made use of that invariant. So we would like to prove that implementation of inset correct. But what does that even mean? What do we mean by, by proving the correctness of an inset implementation? Well, one way to define correctness would be to define some laws that our implementation so this should satisfy and then prove that the implementation indeed does that. So in the case of inset, what laws could we come up with? The first law says uh, the empty set does not contain any, any element. So empty contains x is always false. The second law says that if we add an element x to a set, an arbitrary set, and then ask whether the set contains x, then we are certain that we would get back true. And the third law says that if we add an element x to a set and then ask whether the set contains some other element y, then the answer is the same thing as simply s contains y, so it didn't matter the fact whether we added x or not. The answer will be invariant under that. In fact, one can show that these three laws completely characterize what it is uh, to be an inset. So the, we have now an algebraic specification of insets which is complete. But it still remains how to prove these laws. So let's start with the first one. Empty contains x equals false. Well that one is actually easy because that's a direct uh, consequence of the definition of contains in empty. Have a quick look at it. So here you see empty contains any element would give us false. The second proposition says that if we include x in S and then ask uh, whether the set contains x, we would get true. And that we can prove by a structural induction on the set S. The base case would be the set S is empty, so we are left with the expression empty include x contains x. Now empty include x, we know what that is by the rule of empty dot include. That would give us a non-empty set x with two empty subsets and we ask whether that one contains x. And the answer here is true because of the clause of contains in a non-empty set where we know that if we ask for the element at the top of the tree, then the answer is true. You can compare to the implementation of non-empty to verify that. So that was the base case. What about the induction step? So the induction step would be that we have a tree, call it non-empty, with three elements Z, L, and R. And we have to prove the proposition 
that include x and contains x yields true for each of these trees. We actually have two cases here. We could have the case that the z is the same as the x, or that the z, the element of the non-empty, is different from the x. Let's take these two cases turn by turn. So in the first case, I assume that the z equals x, so I'm left with a tree uh, non-empty x lr, and have to show that include x contains x equals true. So what can we do in this case? Well, uh, we can look at what's the definition of include. If you look that up, then we find that including an element to a tree that already has that element at the root is the original tree. So this expression here would simplify to that one here. And then looking up the contains operation, we, we find that uh, asking contains on a tree that contains that element at the root would give you back true. So the whole expression simplifies to true. So that handles the case where we were left with a non-empty tree and the root element x of the tree was the same element as the one we included and asked for with the contains check. What if the root element is different? There again we have two choices. Uh, either the root element is smaller than our element x or it's larger. So let's look at the case where it's smaller. So we would we have a, a tree a non-empty YLR, we include X, we ask whether it contains X, and we would like it to return true. So the by the definition of non-empty include, we, we can rewrite this term to this one here. Why? Well, because we know that X is greater than the root element Y, so we would have a recursive include at the, on the right hand side of the tree. Okay, let's look at contains now. Again, by the same reasoning, we would have that a contains test of a tree like that would translate into a contains test of its right subtree. So that would be root include x contains x. And now we can apply the induction hypothesis, which says for all subtrees I assume that the property is proven, so I'm left with true. There's a third induction step to do, uh, where now the uh, root element of the tree y is greater than x, but this one is completely analogous to the previous one, so I'm going to omit it. Now let's prove the third proposition. That proposition reads that xs include y contains x is the same as xs contains x, provided x and y are different. So if x and y are different, it makes no difference whether I add y to the set and ask whether and it contains a given element x or whether I ask the set directly. And the proof again would be by structural induction. So assume first that uh, the element that we add is smaller than the element we test for. The dual case where the element we add is larger is completely analogous, so we don't need to do both cases. The base case then would be that the set is empty, so we include an element y into an empty set and then we ask whether it contains x. And to show is that that's actually the same as asking the empty set whether it contains x directly. So empty include y gives us non-empty y empty empty. Asking whether that contains x gives us empty contains x, so more uh, precisely we go in the right subtree because that's where would be x is bigger than y, so that's the empty here. And that concludes the proposition. That's what we needed to show. Now we have to do the inductive step. So the inductive step is a tree non-empty with some root node z and a subtree l and a subtree r. And unfortunately there are five different cases to consider. So the first case is that the root of the tree is the same as the node x. Second one is it's the same as y. The third one is it's smaller than both y and x. The fourth one is it's between y and x. And the fifth one is it's larger than both y and x. So let's look at some of these cases in turn. The first two cases are easy. Let's first assume that the root of our tree is x. So we have this expression here, non-empty xlr include y contains x. So if we include y in a tree like that, then what happens is that we 
actually go to the left subtree and include y here, because by assumption y is smaller than x. So we ask whether that tree contains x, and here the answer is obviously yes, because the tree contains already x at the root. So by the definition of non-empty contains, we get back true, what we wanted. The second case would be that the root of the tree is the same as y. And if we look at the right hand side, uh, non empty xlr contains x, then by the same reasoning that one is also true. So the equation is established. The second easy case is uh, where the root of the tree is the same as y. So now we include y in a tree that already has the root y. And that, of course, is the same as the original tree. That doesn't change anything. And that, again, is what we wanted. So now we come to the more difficult cases. The first case is that we are left with a tree non-empty, ZLR, where Z is smaller than both Y and X. And in that case, we need to show again that uh, that expression here is the same as just non-empty ZLR contains X. So what can we do here? Well. Again, we apply the law of non-empty include to conclude that, yes, we have to include the element y to the right subtree, because y is greater than z. Then we uh, apply the definition of contains to conclude in turn that, yes, we have to look at the right subtree, because x is also greater than z. And then we can apply the induction hypothesis to say, r include y contains x is the same as r contains x, because we assume the theorem to be already proven for r. And that, in fact, is the same as non-empty zlr contains x, because if you simplify that expression, we see that because x is greater than z, we look again at the right subtree r. So again, we have established the equality. The next case is where z is now between y and x. So we have the same situation as before, but the value of z now is between y and x. So what we do in this case here is that uh, including y into the tree here, we go to the left subtree, because y is smaller than z. Asking the contains, uh, we go to the right subtree, because x, x is larger than z. So we look actually, we include and we test in different subtrees. So we're left with r contains x, and that actually is already the same as non empty zlr contains x by the definition of non empty contains read backwards. Because again, for this tree here, we look again in the right subtree. So we've seen that in this case here, we've established the equ equality without resorting to the induction hypothesis, because the inclusion and the test fell into different subtrees. So the third case is where z is larger than both y and x, and that's actually a complete dual of the third case where z was smaller than both y and x. So I have written down the proof here, but I will not go into the details one by one. These are all the cases, so the proposition is established. So this proof was quite involved, but on the other hand, we were also showing something quite significant, namely the correctness of a non-trivial implementation of sets as binary trees. I would argue that the complexity of these purely functional equational proofs often compare favorably with what you would have to do in an imperative language. If you haven't had enough of proving yet, here's an exercise for you which is in fact quite hard. Uh, I come back to the question of adding union to inset. So here's a way to do it which is actually a bit more efficient than the first solution that I've shown you in the worksheet. So we would have uh, the union operation of the empty set is of course the other set that we add to union. And then union of a non-empty set uh, would be defined like this. We take the left subtree, we union it with the right subtree, union it with the other set, and finally include x in, into the resulting tree at the end. So what I would like you to do is to prove the correctness of union, which is translated into the following law. What we would like to have is that if we take the union of two sets and we then ask whether it contains an arbitrary element x, that this is equivalent to asking whether 
either xs contains x or ys contains x. So both sides should be true and false for the same sets and for the same elements. The task then is to show this proposition by using structural induction on xs.